What did Fulton Sheen think about the Second Vatican Council? I want to see that man that uses a chalk and blackboard and tells funny stories. <laughs> Hi, I'm Mary Rose, and I host a podcast called The Crab and the Cross, and I occasionally make YouTube videos when the inspiration strikes. And today I want to talk about one of my heroes, Fulton Sheen, and his thoughts on the Second Vatican Council. So if you don't know who Fulton Sheen is, he was a philosophy professor at the Catholic University for a number of years. He had a radio show, and then he's probably best known for his television series called Life is Worth Living. It even won an Emmy. Um, it was on in the 50s, and so maybe your grandparents remember it, but honestly, he's kind of making a comeback now thanks to YouTube. I believe in the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life is worth living. Amen. <laughs> he also wrote like 60 plus books on theology and philosophy, and then he later went on to be ordained as a bishop in uh, Rochester, New York. So just a quick word about the Second Vatican Council before going forward. It was an ecumenical council in the Catholic Church, which basically means bishops from all over the world gathered in Rome to discuss church doctrine and discipline. It took place between 1962 and 1965, and unlike a lot of the previous church councils like the Council of Ephesus, the Council of Chalcedon, the Council of Trent, which dealt pretty much exclusively with church doctrine, uh, the Second Vatican Council is seen more as a pastoral council, which means that it looked more at the way the church approaches and cares for its flock versus addressing a specific heresy or clarifying a church teaching. I think because it's a little bit less explicit on doctrinal matters, it's become subject to a lot of controversy. But what's really interesting about the Second Vatican Council is it wasn't controversial at the time. If you look at like the records of the different bishops voting on uh, the various documents, every document was passed almost unanimously. Uh, it was really after the council ended that the way certain documents were implemented that things started to get a little bit dicey. Finally picked up the bowl, pulled it over his head and says, look mom, Bishop Sheen. <laughs> In his autobiography, he describes it as one of the greatest blessings of his life. He writes about getting up early and making sure he was in his seat right when things began so as not to miss anything, and just being absolutely riveted by the speeches given. Because it was held at a time when travel was a lot easier than it had been for most of human history, you know, we have airplanes now, um, he says this wasn't just a council of European bishops. This was truly a global council. And he talks with admiration about meeting some of the bishops from Korea and Africa and places where Christianity was heavily persecuted at the time. What's really interesting to me is that Fulton Sheen was an extremely outspoken opponent of communism. And yet the way he speaks about social justice, I think, in some ways puts him more in line with a lot of the progressive Catholics of today who tend to be more left-leaning and more um, open to socialism. He writes, I'm sure that many priests have had the same experience that I have had, that previous to the council, one hardly ever heard of a sin against social justice. For example, paying shamefully low wages to a farm laborer or a maid or an employee. Before Fulton Sheen was Bishop of Rochester, he worked for the Society of the Propagation of the Faith, and he traveled the world raising money for the missions. And so he saw firsthand a lot of the poverty and a lot of the poor treatment of people around the world. And he didn't just say, oh, well, we need to evangelize them, and that's it. He understood there was a physical dimension uh, as well, that we take care of souls, but we also take care of bodies. Be generous with yourself. Just give, give, give. I think, unfortunately, in the church today, you have one side stressing the care of soul and the other side stressing the care of the body, when in reality, they are inseparable. Love of God, love of neighbor. Um, and I think Fulton Sheen rightly understood the relationship between those two dimensions of the gospel. One of the things that Fulton Sheen said that made my jaw drop 
is that he thought there should have been a document on women. The history of civilizations could actually be written in terms of the level of woman. He wrote, I wonder if I was the only conciliar father who, before the council, asked that there be a chapter on women. I had a strong conviction that the feminine principle in religion had been neglected. Many world religions were, were without the feminine principle, and we were beginning to live in an age when women were coming into their own. I still feel that it would have been well to have included a chapter on women. One of the things that I think is beautiful about Catholicism compared to Protestant forms of Christianity is that we have that feminine element, certainly in the Virgin Mary. Um, there is this maternal figure. There is this feminine figure of veneration. And so it doesn't just have this like strictly male patriarchal aspect to it. Um, but I think, yeah, there's implications that maybe have yet to be explored. A woman in professional life is happy when she has an occasion to be feminine. The man is the guardian of nature, but a woman is the custodian of life. And therefore, in whatever she does, she has to have some occasion to be kind and merciful to others. Fulton Sheen died in 1979, and his autobiography was published in 1980. So the dust from the council was still settling, but certainly there have been a variety of interpretations on how to implement the council and already there was a growing movement of people who completely opposed the council and then those who thought the council didn't go far enough. Fulton Sheen speaks about this kind of anti-conciliar spirit with uh, a great deal of harshness. He says, it is a historical fact that whenever there is an outpouring of the Holy Spirit as in a general council of the church there is always an extra show of force by the anti-spirit or the demonic. He goes on to say, in the Second Vatican Council, it was not schism or heresy that was at issue, but rather the church and the world. The world pouring into the church and the church rushing into the world. Man was becoming the center and reference point of everything. This the church could not accept, for it was the church's mission to affirm a divine intervention in the world. The church could not pull up all the drawbridges, lock all the doors, close all the highways which united herself to the world. The answer was not to be found either in an isolation from the world by erecting a red stoplight outside of St. Peter's Square. Neither could the church answer the same challenge the world hurled at its head on the cross. Come down and we will believe. Come down from your belief in the sanctity of marriage. Come down from your belief in the sacredness of life. Come down from your belief. The truth is merely what is pleasing. Come down from the cross of sacrifice and we will believe. He's opposed to worldliness, but he's also opposed to... Um, this like separation of, of church and world. The essence of the satanic or the diabolic is the hatred of the cross of Christ. You know, the time of Christ compared to the time of like 1850 was not really all that different in terms of technology and in terms of way of life. But when you compare 1923 with 1823, when you compare 2023 with 1823, uh, things have changed so rapidly that, you know, reality would be unrecognizable to people of the first century. And that doesn't mean that we need to do away with any of the moral teachings of the church, but it is true that we need to make sure that we are relating to the world in a way that the world is going to understand, in a way that the world is going to receive. The size of the Catholic Church today is basically the size of the world in the 19th century. And so, you know, we're, we're dealing with a global scale that we never thought was possible. Uh, we can connect to people in any part of the world in an instant. And so I think it was actually prophetic um, and timely for the church to get together and say, how, do, how are we going to deal with the rest of the world? Because things we're only going to get crazier. So we become interested in the inhabitants on Mars and flying saucers. Highly recommend his autobiography, Treasure and Clay, and I recommend reading the documents of the Second Vatican Council. How about it, babe? <laughs>